Good morning, DCC. Thank you so much for joining us online. We are so glad that we are able to connect in this way as a community as we wait to resume gathering together in person. If you are interested in learning more about Denver Community Church, our mission, our vision, ways you can get more connected, as well as get to know some of our staff, volunteers, and leadership, I want to invite you to our first ever virtual Discovering Denver Community Church this evening, June 14th at 7.30 p.m. If you are interested, you can register on our website at denverchurch.org. Also, with our growing AV needs, we are looking for anyone interested in audio and video to email Dan Cummings for more information on how to get involved. Finally, we invite you to give financially this morning and support DCC as we connect and care for our community and our city. You can text Denver Church to 77977 to give now. Thank you for your continued generosity. Now, as we move into our time of worship and teaching, I invite you to be present as we listen, learn, and respond together. Thank you for joining us.
shall overcome Love shall overcome Grant, O oh God, that your holy and life-giving spirit may so move in every human heart, especially the hearts of the people of this land, that the barriers which divide us may crumble, suspicions disappear, and hatred cease, that our divisions being healed, we may live in justice and peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, our Father, giver of daily bread, blessing our hands and covering our heads.
Thank you so much for being with us this morning. We ask that you take a moment now to speak grace and peace over some of your loved ones. Whether you guys are sitting together and watching this right now, or whether you can just send a text or call to somebody, um, we ask that you just take a moment to really be intentional about grace and peace. Thank you so much for joining our online community this morning. Well, good morning. Good to be with all of you online. I hope uh, that as the summer season is fully upon us now that you're able to enjoy both moments of pause and that you're able to be outside and enjoy the warm weather. So with that said, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. This morning, we're going to continue our season of teaching on what it means for us to practice love in the way of Jesus. And in the midst of this time in which we find ourselves, with the pandemic and the continued injustices and the protests, I can't think of anything better to talk about than the practice of love. And I say that because it's one thing to talk about love and it's another thing to practice love. Talking about love is often inspiring and moving, whereas the practice of love is demanding and difficult. And too often in my life and in the life of the church and the lives of many, we stop at inspiring and moving. It's just talk. It's merely words. And we fail to practice love. We fail to take steps toward what is demanding and difficult. And in recent weeks, this has been revealed as something that is far too common. And we've been confronted with this truth and it has led many to pause and to reflect and to respond with practice, not just talk. Now, that's a good initial step. But the practice of love is not just something we do once, or it's not just something we do when it's convenient. The practice of love is about learning a way of living. It's about a way of seeing, a way of moving in this world. The practice of love is a long obedience in the same direction. It's not just quick responses or immediate reactions to whatever occupies our attention at any given moment. And I say this because love, as the writer of Colossians writes, is what we are to put on over all virtues because he says it binds them together in perfect unity. Love is the foundation for everything. And which, which means that if we don't have love, we don't have a foundation. And like anything else that exists without a foundation, whether that be our lives, whether that be our words, whether that be our actions, if they do not have a foundation, then they will be flimsy and they will easily collapse. So over the next two weeks, we're going to look at the church in the Greek city of Corinth. Now, this is a church who seemingly had a lot of strength, except they lacked the foundation of love. And so as a way of exploring this together this week, I first want to talk about competition. And then we're going to look at some verses that will probably sting a little bit and then discuss how often we confuse the ends with the means. And finally, one way we can discern whether we are practicing love. So with that said, first, I want to talk about competition. Now, at the beginning of this letter to the church in Corinth in chapter one, if you were to just read the first few verses, then you would probably think, well, this is like an exemplary group of people. Because the letter begins with a greeting, and, and here's what the writer says in verse 4. He says, I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge. God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for the Lord Jesus to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. This is a group of people who's been enriched in every way with knowledge. This is a group of people who don't lack any gift. I mean, this is 
This is quite an endorsement. I mean, imagine sitting there in a room where this letter would have been read aloud. Everyone's gathered together and you hear the words, you don't lack any spiritual gift. Now, this is not bad at all to hear. And I imagine a few are sitting there thinking like, well, we weren't planning to say anything. But, but what he's saying, it's, well, it, it's true. I mean, I, I don't know how to tell you this, but we're kind of a big deal. People know us. We have many leather-bound books and our apartments smell of rich mahogany. And if anyone there was actually thinking anything like that, I mean, at a certain level, they might think they had a right to do so. I mean, the people who were a part of the church in Corinth, they were a gifted bunch. I mean, it's possible if a church like this existed within today's culture in the United States, they would probably hold conferences. They would have a network of talented communicators. There would be best-selling books that were written by their leaders. And of course, they would be sought out by others asking them how they do this and how they do that. And those who were asking the questions would attempt to imitate their success. They'd have incredible branding and they would serve as consultants. They'd have an app both for iOS and Android and their Instagram game, it'd be off the charts. And I point this out because it is often what a local church does or often what they do not lack that we look for when it comes to joining with a local church. We all want to see like, well, what is it that they have to offer? Whether it be their programs or their, their preaching or their music or their buildings or their location or their children's ministry. And, and what's interesting is that in all my years as working as a pastor, there is not one single time I have ever heard anyone say, I chose to join this church or that church because they have committed themselves to the practice of love over and above everything else. And, and what's interesting is that while the writer of this letter, who is presumably the Apostle Paul, while the writer compliments their gifts, much of the rest of the letter does not praise them. Rather, the rest of the letter is actually filled with conversation of correction and rebuke. Much of that focuses on their lack of love and the lack of love that they had took many forms among them. But one of those forms that was the most rampant was competition between them. A competition that settled into their hearts and competition as it always does that brought about division and encouraged ranking among those in the con congregation. And the competitive spirit it is seen immediately in the verses that follow the ones that we just read in chapter one. I mean, apparently there was competition about who followed who. So there was one group in the church in Corinth that proudly said, well, we follow Paul. And another group said, well, we follow Apollos. Another said, well, we follow Peter. I mean, he is the first Pope. Another said, well, we follow Christ, which of course is the game winner because Jesus is always the answer. We see the competition right from the start. They're arguing over who was the best based on whose teachings they followed. And these sorts of arguments and superiority complexes and competitions caused a good amount of strife in that community. So while they did not lack any spiritual gift, they were still going off course. More than that, even though they did not lack any spiritual gift, it turns out that the gifts themselves became grounds for competition. And in the midst of this, the writer insists that when the focus or the, the dedication becomes anything other than love, we will find ourselves walking down a path that we never intended to walk. No matter how may, good we may be at this or that, no matter how gifted, no matter how passionate or intelligent, without love, it means nothing. It's rubbish. And this is what the writer directly addresses later in the letter. So with that in mind, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, between chapter 1 and chapter 12, the writer addresses all sorts of issues that were plaguing the church at that time. But here in chapter 12, he finally addresses what are commonly called the spiritual gifts. These are the gifts that they did not lack. And in chapter 12, he begins reminding those in the church of the gifts they possess 
which have now become the gifts they're leveraging for competition. And he reminds them that their gifts are not to be confused with talents or skills that, I don't know, maybe come from their natural ability. These are the gifts that have been given to them by the Spirit, which means that you're competing over them is ludicrous. This is like a little kid bragging to their friends about how big their house is. It's not your house. You've done nothing to build it and you've spent no money to buy it. So stop bragging. In the same way, these gifts have been given to this church, to them. They are an act of grace. They are given by the spirit. So stop bragging. They're not yours. They've been given to you. Then the writer tells them that the competition is pointless because all the gifts that they're competing over, all of them are needed. None of these gifts are dispensable. Even more, it's the diversity among them that allows them to work well together and it makes things more beautiful. The writer explains this by using the image and the picture of the body. And he says, listen, if the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? And if the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? Meaning, if you all had the same gift, you would be lesser, not greater. He then goes on to say, like, the eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. And the hand cannot say to the, or the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. Uh, of course not. He's saying all of you are needed. And no matter one's opinion of what gift they do or don't have, when you consider the argument and the competition that was happening in the community, it sounds, well, honestly, it sounds pretty idiotic and immature and ridiculous. I mean, think about it. They've been arguing over which gifts are the best, which gifts graciously given by the Spirit of God, which of them is the best gift. I mean, can you, I can't even imagine like what they were saying to each other. I mean, is someone like, hey, uh, I'm not sure if you heard, but uh, I was just speaking in tongues. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I just opened my mouth and this stuff comes to me. It's pretty incredible. And someone else is like, well, uh, bless your heart. But, you know, we appreciate you and your gifts, but the best gift is clearly prophecy, which takes a ton of insight. And thankfully, I have a lot of that. Someone else is like, well, really? It doesn't sound like you have much insight because really it's all about faith. I mean, if you have faith like me, it said that you can move mountains. At least that's what I've heard somebody said at some point. And then someone else is like, yeah, but you know what? None of you would even have food to eat if it wasn't for people like me who give. And I didn't want to have to say this, but I'm pretty generous. I'm really generous. And I'm not going to say how much I give, but it is a double digit percentage. I mean, if you start even considering this conversation they're having, many of us would probably roll our eyes and we would think this is, this is completely idiotic and ridiculous. And we would look at them and think they obviously don't get it. But I wonder, do we get it? I mean, are we really any better? Because if all we do is look at this small church in Corinth believing, well, they didn't get it, then we may miss an opportunity to see how we, in a similar way, may not get it. And I can say this confidently. When I look at the capital C church in the United States, it appears as though we still have conversations much like this. And that includes us here at Denver Community Church. Now, of course, we would never call it competition. I mean, we don't do that. But you can call it whatever you want. But at the bottom, if we're really honest, many of us still measure and we compare ourselves to others. And where there is competition, there is a lack of love. And I say this because I've worked as a pastor for more than two decades in three different church contexts. And one thing I know to be true is this. So many churches talk about what they are most definitely not. We are not like that church. I am not like that pastor. We are not those kinds of Christians. We are not like them because to be like them would be to lessen who we are. It's drawing comparisons and contrasts as a way of telling ourselves we are better than them. And by the way, if most of our conversation is about what we are not, just let me share this observation. Our conversations lack a lot of creativity. 
And when we're done talking about what we are not, then it's the things we do that they don't do. And this spirit of comparison and contrast, and yes, competition is still alive and well. So as much as the writer addresses this in a 2000 year old letter, we may wanna ask how this addresses the competition within our hearts and within the church today. And in this consideration, maybe we should listen to the writer's appeal to love, the insistence on the foundational importance of love. And this is where the writer leads the conversation to the end of chapter 12. And this is where we'll begin reading in verse 31. The writer says, and yet I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men or angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give my body over to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love, he says, is the most excellent way, which I'm pretty sure is the Bill and Ted's translation. Now in our day, those verses are most often read at weddings. And so we hear these verses and we hear the words flow and we see them as this moving poem, one that extols the beauty and the power and the transcendence of love. But I think these verses sting a little bit. And by the way, what I'm about to tell you might ruin your ears forever when you hear them read at a wedding. Because consider the backdrop of what's happening in the community when you hear these verses. Those who are listening to this letter read are arguing over who has the best gift. And the writer says, sure, you're not lacking in any gifts, but you are lacking in love. So your gifts don't matter. I mean, what if you were someone with the gift of tongues and you really believed your gift was the top of the heap and you made no bones about saying so? And you sit there among your, your congregation and you hear the letter read aloud and the writer says, without love, you're only a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal. That is not a compliment. Or, or what if you believe that prophecy, your gift was the best and you were inclined to share that opinion often, even when you weren't asked. And you hear the letter read aloud and the writer says, you know, without love, you are nothing. At that point, you're not sitting there wondering, well, I wonder what he actually means when he says nothing. That stings a little bit, doesn't it? You see, 1 Corinthians 13 has often been called the love chapter. But when we consider the context, when we recognize these verses are highly charged language. These verses are an incredibly high challenge. And for those who believed their own press, they would have been knocked down a few runs. I mean, maybe, we, maybe our, as a way of understanding, we ought to put these verses into our context. I mean, imagine if we were to receive a letter like this. Imagine if we were to receive a letter like this in our current context here in Denver, Colorado in 2020 at Denver Community Church. What would these verses sound like to our ears? What would these verses say to us in our time and place right now? Maybe these verses would say something like this. If I can articulate my reasons for deconstructing my faith of origin and compellingly argue for a more generous spirituality, but do not have love, I am only nails on a blackboard or a fork screeching across a dinner plate. If I have been given insight and can stand comfortably in liminal space and dwell in mystery, and if I possess the strength to overcome struggle, but do not have love, I am a nobody. If I live simply so the poor can have more and give myself over to crying out for justice, but do not have love, my actions are good for nothing. Now it's possible we hear these words and think, now like, hang on a second. Or we hear this and something in us, it's just bothered. Maybe our first response is to hear this read and we get a little bit defensive. That's, if that's how we feel, that's precisely the point. These verses were not easy to hear. These verses stung when they heard them and they sting, they stung then and they sting now. 
Because it's really easy to get busy doing something we believe to be the best thing, maybe even better than what others are doing. And it's easy to do those things without love, which means we're practicing something, but whatever we're practicing, it's not love. And any time that is the case, whenever that is true of us, we can be confident that it is not good or right or the best. Not at all. According to the writer of this letter, it's rubbish. And by the way, I know this to be true, not because I've seen it out there with them, but because I have seen it with me in here. I can tell you that in my work as a pastor, there have been moments when I do something or when I say something or when I write something or post something, even moments, by the way, when I do those things and they've been met with applause or they've been met with the support of others. But if I'm honest, in some of those moments, I've said or done those things, I've said or done those things without love, which means even in the moments those things have garnered some applause, well, those things are crap. They mean nothing. Now, I, I want to be clear, I didn't set out purposefully to do this. It's not like I was thinking I am riddled with indifference or like I'm filled with hate, but I'm going to make it look like I'm filled with love. That's not at all what I was doing. And I can honestly say most of the time, I, I didn't even do those things to get the applause of others. But what I did do is I confused the ends with the means. Now, here's what I mean by that. I often failed to remember what, that love is the end of all things. I've often failed to remember that love is where this whole thing is headed. Everything whether things in heaven or things on earth, all things are moving toward an all-encompassing, inclusive embrace found in the heart of the divine. This is what the writer of Ephesians was talking about when he spoke of Christ bringing union to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. A more literal translation of that verse in Ephesians chapter one would be that he will bring into one the whole in Christ. He will bring into one the whole in Christ. This is the reconciliation of all things. This is the participation in the life of God who is love. And the sacred text contends that we and all, thing, all things are being drawn toward love, that love is the end of all things. This is the vision. This is the picture of the future. But too often I have been confused and I have believed that something else was better or something else was the vision, something other than love. I, I thought perhaps something else in that moment was more important. I confused the vision with the vehicle. I confused the ends with the means. You see, gifts are given as a vehicle. They are given to us as a way to move toward the vision. So whatever the gift is, it is a means to the end. It is a vehicle to lead us toward the vision. But the end, the vision is always love. Gifts are given to build up one another more fully. They are given to enable us to experience love more deeply. And anytime we get that backward, anytime love plays second, Whenever we make the mistake of seeing something else as the vision, that's when we get it wrong. That's when I have gotten it wrong way too many times. And when we make this mistake, we can actually prevent others and we can prevent ourselves from freely experiencing the love of God. I think, by the way, this is what got Jesus like, so fired up in his day. Many believe that Jesus was against religion, but I'm honest, I'm not sure that's the case. I think what Jesus was against was the people who would put religion first. When people saw religion as the end, when people saw religion as the vision, and any time this happened, Jesus would say, tear it down. Because while healthy religion can be a vehicle to move us toward the heart of God, unhealthy religion can be a barrier to moving toward the heart of God. And the difference between healthy and unhealthy religion is when we fail to see love as the end. This is why legalism is so destructive. 
It demands behavioral purity. And that becomes the division or the vision in and of itself. This is why dogma can be so dangerous. It demands ideological purity and it makes a rigid set of beliefs the gold standard and puts propositional statements and particular wording above everything else. And by the way, this sort of legalism and this kind of dogma, this exists in both conservative and liberal circles and with everybody in between. And any part of our spiritual or religious tradition, whether it's gatherings or disciplines or rituals or theologies, any of those can be misplaced and become the vision. And when that happens, we get it wrong. This is what Jesus stood against. Jesus was not about to stand by and see people pushed away from the heart of God by poor religion. Healthy religion sees itself as a vehicle that serves to bring us toward the vision, that see, it serves to bring us toward the heart of God. It is a means, not the end, because the end is always love. And the same thing is true of gifts. When gifts are the focus rather than the means to an end, they can prevent us from moving closer to the heart of a loving God. And this is what was happening in the church in Corinth. And this is what Paul is speaking to, which of course raises the question, like, okay, well, how do we know the difference of means and ends and when we're doing this right and, and, and getting a, a, it wrong? Which is, by the way, a great question. Thank you for asking. And this leads us to one way we can discern whether or not we are practicing love. It's interesting that Paul, throughout chapter 12, chastises this church for competing over their gifts. But then just before he speaks of love, he encourages them to, quote, eagerly desire the greater gifts. And so at first it sounds like Paul is endorsing some gifts over others, or maybe he's ranking them, which is the problem to begin with. And he sort of is doing that, but not in a way that puts one person over the other. In fact, it's just the opposite. In chapter 14, the discussion of gifts continues. And it's there that we learn the greater gifts of which Paul speaks are the gifts employed for the sake of others and not for the sake of self. Gifts used, he says, that are there to build up the body. Gifts that strengthen and encourage and lend comfort to others. Gifts that edify the whole congregation. These, he says, these are the greater gifts. Perhaps we can summarize it this way. If your gifts or you're using gifts, if it's about you, it's not great and it's not love. But if your gifts and you're using gifts, if it's about others, well, then it is great and it is love. Let me say that again. If this is about you, it's not great and it's not love. If it's about others, it is great and it is love. This kind of thinking cuts against the grain of competition. This is putting gifts in their proper place as means and keeping love in its rightful place as the end. And here is the power in this way of thinking. When we do this, when we use whatever gifts we have been given us and when they are powered by love, meaning when they are used for the sake of others, everyone benefits. Because as Paul teaches in chapter 12, we're all part of the same body. And if one part is stronger and healthier and more alive, then the whole body is stronger and healthier and more alive. And this allows for all sorts of new possibilities. Because in strengthening one another, we draw together and allow for something new to be born within us and within our world. This is what love does. It unites and in its union, it births something new. I mean, just consider the fact that all being, everything that exists is the result of two separate things coming together. Atoms exist because some subatomic particles came together. You exist because, well, because there was a bottle of wine and there was a, a nice dinner and My Heart Will Go On by Celine Dion was playing in the background, and, well, you get the point. Two people came together, and you are the result. Elia Delio points this out in a much 
better way than I could in her wonderful book, The Unbearable Wholeness of Being. And she writes this, I do not exist in order that I may possess. Rather, I exist in order that I may give of myself. For it is in giving that I am myself. Cosmic life is intrinsically communal. Being is first a we before it can become an I. There is no being who can stand up and say, I did it alone. Rather, the universe is thoroughly relational and in the framework of love. We do not exist and we are not given gifts in order that we might possess anything. Rather, we exist and we are given gifts in order that we may give of ourselves and share our gifts. And it is in this that we strengthen and encourage and lend comfort to others. And in this that we are truly ourselves. For it is then that we discover the practice of love. It is then that we root ourselves in the heart of God who is love. It is then that we participate in the life of the divine. And it is in those moments when we root ourselves in the heart of God, when we participate in God's life, when we give ourselves for the sake of the other, then whatever we find ourselves doing in those moments, whether it's through using our gifts or speaking a word of encouragement to another person or, or taking needed action, or maybe it's just giving generously or standing with those on the margins or confronting injustice or sitting with somebody in their suffering or speaking truth to power or courageously offering insight that's needed in the life of a friend. Whatever it is we find ourselves doing, when we do this for the sake of the other, to build them up or to edify the body, to strengthen and to encourage and to lend comfort, then in those moments, we can know that we are practicing love in the way of Jesus. I really think it's that simple. And though I say it's that simple, it also is incredibly difficult. Paraphrasing G.K. Chesterton, he says, the way of love has not been tried and found wanting. It's been found difficult and left untried. So I wonder, like, what if we actually tried this? What if we stopped insisting people listen to our agenda and instead sought to serve them and build them up? What if we stopped speaking to people as though they needed to learn something we already know and instead sought to listen to them, believing they have something that we need to know? What if we stopped doing all sorts of things that we felt obliged to do or things that we believe might curry favor from others and gave ourselves over to serving and helping in any way we could that we thought would build others up? You see, it's possible if this is the kind of life we sought to live, maybe we might just find ourselves participating in the life of God. We might find ourselves drawing close to one another. We just might find ourselves moving in sync with our universe that is thoroughly relational and in the framework of love. Learning and knowing that love is the end, that love is what matters. The activist Dorothy Day speaks about love. And when she does, she says these words. She says, love and evermore love is the only solution to every problem that comes up. If we love each other enough, we will bear each other's faults and burdens. If we love enough, we are going to light a fire in the hearts of others. And it is love that will burn out the sins and hatreds that sadden us. It is love that will make us want to do great things for each other. No sacrifice and no suffering will be too much. So may we see that love and evermore love is indeed the only solution to every problem. And may that cause us to love each other to the extent that we will bear with each other's faults and with each other's burdens. May we love enough that we light a fire in the hearts of each other, a fire that will burn out the sins and hatreds that sadden us so that in the end, we will indeed practice love in the way of Jesus and find ourselves wanting to do great things for each other, recognizing no sacrifice in no suffering will ever be too much. Let's pray together. God, we recognize, we recognize that we can often be those who can become so caught up in 
and so committed to doing something, saying something that we believe is the right thing, that we believe is the good thing, that we believe is the just thing. We recognize that we might do those things and get so far down the road only then to recognize we've been doing them not rooted in love, which means that all of our efforts, all of our striving, all of our energy has, is good for nothing. So I ask that you would give us these moments to reflect on who we are, on what, our, what motivates us, on what we're rooting ourselves in so that we might discover how in a more profound way than ever, we can practice love in the way of Jesus. Our great example, one who lived his life, one who gave himself over and one who did all things with a longing for others. May we grow in our imitation of that we ask. We pray these things together this morning in the strong name of Jesus and all of our friends said together online, amen. Let's say together now our prayer of confession and assurance. Almighty and most merciful God, we confess that we have fallen short in love, in word, in thought, and in deed, by what we have done and what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. God, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. Grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image to the glory of your name. Amen. Remember that you are loved, you are forgiven, and you belong.
for the glory of the Spirit. Let us be known by our love. Take a moment now and prepare your elements as we get ready for communion. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup, and he gave him thanks, and he gave it to them, saying, Drink from all of it. This is the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for all of you, for the forgiveness of sins. God, we thank you for the gift of communion, for the gift of your love and we lift up our hearts now to you and receive. Now I invite you to take your bread and remember that this is Christ's body, which was broken for you. And as you dip the bread in the wine or the juice, remember that this is Christ's blood poured out for you. Amen. Thank you for joining us for worship this morning. Remember, if you would like to register for our Discovering Denver Community Church happening tonight at 7.30, you can do so by going to our website at denverchurch.org.
As you go, I invite you to do so in a posture of grace and love toward all those you encounter. My brothers and sisters, may we remember that we do not exist to possess, rather we exist in order that we might give ourselves to others, that love might abound. Peace be with you.